Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to tonight's virtual author's talk. My name is Andrew Outen, and I'm the Historical Programs Manager for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. The American Revolution Institute promotes knowledge and appreciation for the achievement of American independence, fulfilling the aim of the Continental Army officers and their French counterparts who founded the Society of the Cincinnati in 1783 to perpetuate the memory and legacy of the American Revolution. In addition to tonight's program, the Institute continues to fill, fulfill that aim by supporting advanced study, developing changing exhibitions uh, and other historical programs and tours, advocating for historic preservation and providing resources to classrooms nationwide that benefit teachers, students and scholars alike. Tonight's author's talk, a program that is made possible in part from a generous gift from the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati, features Tim Campo discussing his recent book, uh, Dishonored Americans, the Political Death of Loyalists in Revolutionary America, which was published by the University of Virginia Press. Tim Campo is an assistant professor of history at Huron University College in Ontario, Canada. He earned his PhD from the West uh, University of Western Ontario, and his research focuses on the British Empire in the 18th century and early 19th century, with a specific focus on honor culture and loyalism in the Age of Revolutions. In addition to his teaching career, he is the project director of Loyalist Migrations, a partnership with the United Empire Loyalist Associations of Canada, which allows researchers to access, uh, access to genealogical records and other archival sources to reconstruct the migrations of thousands of exiles, refugees, economic migrants, settlers, and soldiers from all walks of life who fled the American Revolution. He was also the co-editor of Seeing the Past with Computers, Experiments with Augmented Reality and Computer Vision for History, which was published by the University of Michigan Press in 2019. Now, before I turn things over uh, to Dr. Campo, I must, as always, cover the usual Zoom housekeeping items for tonight's program. Uh, following the talk, there will be a question and answer session, so please feel free to submit your questions for the speaker at any point during the presentation by using the Q&A function that can be found at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to answer them all, as always. Uh, should you have any technical related questions or comments, those can be submitted by using the chat function, and one of our staff members will be monitoring that and will do their best to assist you. So with all of that, and without further delay, please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Dr. Tim Campo. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with you tonight. Thank you, Andrew, for the invitation and for uh, that very kind introduction. Um, so I'm uh, really delighted to be here this evening uh, to talk to you uh, about my new book, uh, the On the Loyalists in the American Revolution. Um, and I'll just get my screen shared here. All right. Uh, so I understand that I'm, I think, the third uh, speaker on Loyalists that has uh, been with you um, over the past few months. And there have been several books on Loyalism published in the United States this past year. Uh, so the Loyalists are having a, a bit of a moment, as they seem to do every so often. Uh, so what am I adding to this discussion? Um, well, Dishonored Americans is a cultural history that explores how revolutionaries use the language and customs of dishonor against loyalists and how those same loyalists articulated and defended their cause, rationalized their crushing defeat, and eventually restored their place in society relying on that same honor culture. So the loyalists, I argue, suffered a political death at the hands of their enemies. And this is a term I came across in legal records and in the broader print culture of the era, and it was used in sort of two related ways. And you can see here on your screen an advertisement from the Connecticut Probate Court um, advertising or calling for creditors to make their claims on the estates of two loyalists they describe as politically deceased. One of them, Joel Stone, is actually the uh, subject of a new biography I'm working on. And he left behind uh, a really extensive set of, of records about his experiences. And he wrote that his revolutionary enemies considered him, quote, unworthy to live. Um, but rebel authorities rarely followed through with their threats to execute Crown supporters, with some important uh, exceptions to that. 
Um, instead, as Stone and other loyalists discovered, revolutionaries focused their energy on containing and neutralizing loyalism through a concerted legal and social campaign of ostracism and dishonor that targeted loyalist rights as citizens and householders. So rather than hang Joel Stone for his loyalism, Connecticut authorities confiscated his property and declared him politically deceased. So the term political death was used for white males who were stripped of their rights to citizenship, uh, property ownership, uh, the right to conduct business, and to be the head of a household, all the things that made a propertied man a gentleman or, or a gentleman. So political death was the destruction of the public existence or the public face of a man. And the legal consequences of loyalism uh, varied from state to state, and the experience of political death was often personalized through local communal judgments. And in many, case, uh, many cases, these were enacted through folk rituals, uh, insults, ostracism, and other kinds of non-lethal violence that denied a formerly respected white man his right to respect, his honor. So as a contributor to the Vermont, uh, to a Vermont newspaper you see on your screen there, um, as they explained after the war, a man's honor is his, is, is his political life. And the moment he sacrifices it, he dies a political death. He is no longer a useful member of the community, but is truly a burden to society. And in this case, he's not talking, they're not talking about loyalists. They're just talking about people who generally dishonor themselves as a, as a public man. So rather than physically kill white land-owning loyalists, the revolutionaries dishonored them, whether enacted through uh, informally through insults or shaming rituals, or officially through acts of attainder, property confiscation, uh, or imprisonment, patriots drew on the power of dishonor to strip loyalists of their status and their manhood. And this was an incredibly effective way to neutralize and discredit loyalists and loyalism, not with intellectual or ideological arguments, although that did happen, of course, but with visceral and emotional attacks that cut to the core of an 18th century uh, white man's identity. So American colonists could be sure that by rejecting loyalism and embracing the revolution, that they would not be subject to these kinds of humiliation. The Pennsylvania loyalist Joseph Galloway described these experiences as, quote, penalties more severe than death itself. And that was precisely what the uh, revolutionaries intended. So Dishonored Americans explores, uh, I guess, the life cycle of uh, male loyalists uh, from their experience of political death and dishonor, uh, captivity, their role in the War of Independence, uh, and finally to the construction of their identity in exile and political rebirth, both in the British Empire and in the United States. And so tonight, I want to take you through uh, a few of the arguments in the book and discuss a little about the loyalist legacy, uh, both in the United States and in Canada. So I'm zooming in uh, tonight from London, Ontario, Canada, and that's a town first laid out in 1793 by John Graves Simcoe, uh, a name that might be notorious among uh, revolutionaries. Um, but one that's memorialized in the name of towns, uh, streets, and there's a lake here in Ontario. And Simcoe wanted to prevent another American Revolution by recreating England as much as possible uh, in laws, in institutions, and in place names. Uh, so here in London, he renamed the Antler River, known as the Deshkon uh, Zibi, to the Anishinaabe people. Uh, he renamed it the Thames River. And if you visit London, you'll find a Piccadilly, Hyde Park, Pall Mall, all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, this city, and really all of Upper Canada, um, as the province was called then, was to be one of several loyalist uh, sanctuaries or refuges, uh, refuges in the uh, uh, Atlantic world. So the loyalists left their mark on Ontario and parts of Quebec, as well as the maritime provinces of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island. And you can see here uh, a map showing the heritage sites and memorials dedicated to loyalists in Ontario. And uh, loyalist migrants and refugees represented really a cross section of colonial America. There were some prominent merchants and off officials and landholders, uh, the sort of gentlemen that show up in my book. Um, but most, over 90 percent, uh, were simple farmers. Uh, there were black Americans who joined with the British to escape slavery. 
uh, others forcibly uh, removed by uh, from the states by their loyalist enslavers and brought to Canada. And there were also Britain's indigenous allies, uh, forced out of the new uh, United States, for siding with the crown. So whatever motivated loyalists, their personal interest, ideology, emotional attachment to the crown, uh, whatever, they were unified by this collective experience of persecution. And for some, this forged a new identity that they passed on to a new generation in these loyalist settlements. So each of these sites of memory, uh, these are plaques and parks, uh, monuments, are directly connected to a story, a past life from uh, the American Revolution in the United States. Um, so this is a screenshot from the other project I'm working on that Andrew mentioned uh, called Loyalist Migrations that visualizes the Loyalist scattering in the aftermath of the American Revolution. And the red dots, they mark where a Loyalist was born and the blue uh, where they finally resettled if they left the United States. And if I zoom out, you can begin to get a sense of the broader impact of the revolution in settling not only Canada, uh, but also the Caribbean and further abroad. And if you visit, visit the site, you can uh, click on these lines and get a snapshot of a family turned upside down uh, by the war. And we'll probably never know for sure the numbers of loyalists that were uh, in the American Revolution. Um, maybe 500,000 colonists from all walks of life were somehow connected to the loyalist cause. So that's maybe one in five Americans. Um, and historians continue to debate the numbers that left um, but perhaps somewhere in the ballpark of 60,000 uh, departed for Canada, Britain, uh, for the Caribbean islands, uh, and so on, um, between 1783 and 1784 and a few years after. So the loyalists of the American Revolution represent a shared history, um, yet in the past, there were two very distinct and competing narratives or myths that uh, formed in the generations uh, after the revolution. So uh, for much of the 19th century and into the first half of the 20th century, English Canadian school children were taught uh, that their national story largely began with the Loyalist arrival in Canada. And as you see on these, uh, within this picture and at the monument shown on your screen, uh, these were supposedly good, honest, hardworking, middle-class Americans who were hounded and persecuted and finally forced into exile rather than betray their principles. And a Canadian historian wrote in 1898 that the Loyalists were, quote, the very cream of the population of the 13 colonies. They represented in very large measure the learning, the piety, the gentle birth, uh, the wealth and good, citizen good citizenship of the British race in America. So today, the Loyalists aren't quite as present in Canadian popular memory as they once were. Uh, Canadians likely know uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, uh, but are unlikely to know or be able to name any Loyalists uh, uh, by name. Um, and there are areas of Canada that still celebrate the Loyalist past, and uh, although in Ontario that kind of gets mixed up with the War of 1812. And uh, as Andrew mentioned in his introduction, there's an organization of descendants called the United Empire Loyalist Association uh, that commemorates uh, and uh, still carries on uh, the history of their ancestors. Um, but no one really fights over whether we are living up to uh, the political vision that the Loyalists once had for the Canadian provinces. Uh, I think in the United States, it's fair to say that the Loyalists were largely forgotten, um, except for the most villainous Tories. Um, the revolutionaries labeled the Loyalists as cowardly, effeminate collaborators, uh, and brutal thugs. And the image of the effete Tory and his crooked henchmen continued into novels and film and television into the 20th century. So the myth of the Tory villain, of course, rankled Loyalist descendants in Canada, um, and whether the Hollywood writers knew it or not, these depictions of Loyalists burning down churches and killing idealistic young boys um, come directly from the pages of revolutionary pamphlets and newspapers. And for generations, uh, I think the Loyalists also perplexed American historians. Um, in 1974, uh, Bernard Balin, one of the leading figures of the 20th century study of the American Revolution, wrote incredulously that historians had not made it, quote, clear why any sensible, well-informed, right-minded American with a modicum of imagination and common sense 
could possibly have opposed the revolution. And his loyalist historians love to, to quote that one. Um, and arguments continue 50 years later over whether the loyalists were driven by intellectual ideas uh, shared throughout the British Atlantic or by localized self-interest. So the pieces of the loyalist puzzle, as Robert Calhoun referred to the problem, uh, have increased even more over the decades as historians compared regional variations, as well as the experiences of women loyalists, of black loyalists, and Britain's indigenous allies. And the incredible different situation faced by loyalists who sought to return to the United States and others who sought, to, sought refuge in the British Empire add even more complexity. So the loyalists continue to perplex historians uh, because, as my colleague Casey Tillman writes, there were loyalisms and not loyalism. But we still have many unanswered questions, and my book examines or uh, uh, re-examines an important piece of the puzzle that for generations was really regarded as the only piece, the loyalist gentleman. So for many historians, literate white loyalists revealed their motivation, uh, their worldview, through intellectual writings uh, and newspapers and pamphlets. And these histories provide really essential insights for understanding loyalism. But for all the energy that loyalist spokesmen and clergymen put in their pamphlets uh, and their sermons, uh, I find it difficult to see uh, those ideas reflected uh, all the time in the actions of the loyalists. So by adopting a cultural history approach, uh, my book explores the more visceral elements of the loyalist experience and uh, tries to explain the central importance of honor culture in the civil war between loyalists and patriots. So historians of the revolutionary era and the early republic have uh, worked on honor quite a bit and they've revealed how honor culture shaped the public sphere and government, how it fueled uh, oppressive racial inequalities, how it was democratized, how it ignited duels and affairs of honor. Uh, yet honor was also a fluid and pliant idea and was a matter of communal interpretation and judgment. So 18th century honor culture might be associated in our minds with the duel, um, but in fact, it was an ethos that really prized restraint, uh, peacemaking, uh, and respect for hierarchy. And thus, at a family or community level, uh, honor culture helped preserve group cohesion and subtle conflicts without them spiraling into feuds. Um, but in short, honor was an inescapable part of the culture. But what was it? What was honor? So most of us know what we mean by honor when we hear the word, integrity, honesty. Uh, an honor system relies on you not to take more candy from the bowl than, than you're meant to. Um, we might think of honor as, might think of being honored, of getting an award. Uh, so in that sense, we can think of honor as uh, reputation or public esteem. But these ideas fall short of what people in the 18th century meant by honor. Our society isn't dominated by honor culture anymore. And according to the scholar Alexander Welsh, attitudes changed radically in the early 20th century when the, quote, machine guns and artillery of the First World War opened a mass grave for honor. In other words, we don't think like people did 250 years ago. The anthropologist Frank Henderson Stewart defines honor as a right to respect. Um, that is a right to have other people treat uh, you in ways that recognize your dignity or your value or your rank. So Stewart's study is really interesting because he compares German, Arab, English concepts of honor and demonstrates how this very general definition of a right to respect plays out in different cultures and societies. What is considered honorable? what is insulting, who is excluded from honor. Honor is about public performance as much as it is inward virtue. And of course, there are regional and professional variations. Uh, the honor of a Southern planter is going to be different from the honor uh, from a New England merchant. Um, and that merchant is going to have, uh, have a different sense of a threshold of what is insulting or what is respectful than a Royal Navy officer and so on. So think too about uh, George Washington's rules of civility uh, and decent behavior that he wrote down as a teenager, the code that he copied out uh, and memorized, right? So everyone could aspire to a kind of honor among their peers, regardless of their rank or where they stood in society, but gentlemen were expected to embrace this more elevated or uh, refined sense of honor. 
So honor is about gender roles. Uh, a man's honor is his manhood. Uh, is he competent, intelligent, honest, in control of his emotions? Will he repay his debts? Uh, is he brave in the face of danger? Uh, the New York poet Hannah Lawrence uh, Schieflin, uh, uh, the wife of a loyalist, uh, applauded General Richard Montgomery's heroic death at the siege of Quebec in 1775 as stemming, quote, from the delicate sense of honor and fear of reproach that influenced the minds of the truly brave. So likewise, according to the mores of the day, uh, a woman showed her honor by being virtuous, uh, caring, hardworking, loyal to her husband, and so on. And think, too, about the role that slavery played in this culture, the daily presence of enslaved people who were considered totally dishonored, not because of anything they did, but because of who they were. And this intensified the idea that some people deserved a special respect uh, just because of who they were, that is, white propertyed men and their families. So what all this boils down to is that to be honored, to be a gentleman in this society was to have access to social and economic power over others and to hold the moral certainty that one was entitled to that power. So to be dishonored, as white loyalist landholders were in the revolution, was to lose everything that set a gentleman above uh, other people, and that was political death. So I should point out that a lot of these ideas existed more in the minds of the so-called gentlemen. And long before the revolution, uh, colonial gentlemen found their sort of pretenses and claims to special respect uh, questioned by uh, or denied by their fellow colonists who were comparatively uh, uh, quite well off compared to their European cousins. Um, so there are a couple of paintings I use with my students uh, just to demonstrate some of these ideas and to get them thinking about how honor was performed. Um, this is Ralph Izzard of South Carolina and his wife, Alice Delancey of, uh, of the Delanceys, the prominent New York family of Loyalists. Um, and I like this picture because it just sort of demonstrates so much about the way that gentlemen and gentle women were expected to dress and act their part. So 18th century Anglo-Americans believed that not only social status, but inner virtue could be read on the body. And here you can see sort of an ideal presentation of a gentleman. So uh, uh, Ralph Izzard's clothes are well-made, but they're not ostentatious. Uh, he is relaxed. Uh, and he and his wife are surrounded by all these classical illusions that speak to his education, to his taste and refinement. And I think most importantly, um, uh, Copley is, uh, has de depicts Alice looking at Ralph. Her gaze is right at Ralph, um, who is holding that sketch, but his gaze is elsewhere. He is contemplating some great idea that we aren't privy to. Um, and everything else in this scene, everything in this scene belongs to Mr. Izzard. Uh, and it suggests his power, his ease with that power, um, his right to those things, including the enslaved people that are not shown in this, in this painting. And so this is a man, a Southerner with honor. And here is a different scene that shares some of the same ideas. Um, art historians think that this is the loyalist uh, Guy Johnson, and he's dressed in an ensemble that blends both the British fashions and elements of Indigenous dress, so appropriated and made genteel. So Johnson is an officer in the Indian Department and, uh, and is supposed to be in command of the frontier. And you can make out um, uh, Niagara Falls in the background. Um, so he is also at peace, um, but he has his musket with him. And notice the gaze from the Indigenous man, and this is identified as the Mohawk chief, uh, uh, Karen, uh, Karen Gan uh, Yantai, uh, who is also known as David Hill. Um, and But Benjamin West is building an idealized gendered and racial hierarchy here, uh, the mastery of English honor over uh, and masculinity over this Indigenous man. And the power relationship, I think, is meant, intended to be very clear. Johnson is drawing from and dominating the American frontier and supposedly providing guidance and civilization in return. And this is what the gentleman does. He has the moral right to lead and to be respected because he is supposedly uh, more competent and more virtuous. He has honor. So with that in mind, let's look at the most famous or infamous image of an attack on a loyalist. So here you can see 
a manifestation of political death. This is supposedly Captain John Malcolm of Boston, and he's being tarred and feathered in 1774, as it's depicted by this London engraver. And this was a deeply unpleasant thing to experience, um, but it was not the guillotine, um, and it was not a firing squad. So from the perspective of the 21st century, and when compared to bloody revolutions and civil wars uh, since the American War of Independence, patriot action against loyalists might not appear so bad. Loyalists and patriots killed each other on the battlefield, and there were atrocities committed throughout the conflict, um, but there was no murderous campaign of deadly violence against elite loyalists. Um, yet considering the culture I've just been describing, the humiliation and dishonor you see here must be considered, I think, a genuine form of violence, a serious form of violence. An enslaved person or a sailor might be flogged, but customs of respect uh, protected a gentleman's body. This was a widely accepted cultural reality, uh, both in Europe and in uh, the colonies. Thus, anti-loyalist action, especially in the early years of the conflict, and when directed against these so-called gentlemen, involved very specific kinds of transgressions that may not appear to us as violent as they did uh, to patriots and loyalists. So in Adam Smith's uh, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, uh, he explains that according to the laws of honor, to strike with a cane dishonors, to strike with a sword does not, for an obvious reason. Uh, and that reason is might not be so obvious to us any longer. But he writes, those slighter punishments, uh, when inflicted on a gentleman, to whom dishonor is the greatest of evils, come to be regarded among humane and generous people as the most dreadful of any. And though the state may take the life of a gentleman, it, quote, respects the honor upon, expect, respects their honor upon almost, uh, upon almost all. To scourge a person of quality, to set him in the pillory upon any crime, whatever, is a brutality of which no European government is capable, he writes. So among gentlemen, a physical death uh, might settle accounts for a crime or an insult, um, but the honor of a man was left intact or even restored upon death. So to shame a gentleman, to bring about a political death, was cruel beyond belief. So Smith's insights, uh, I think, brings us closer to understanding the power of dishonor in the 18th century mind. Uh, comparatively few loyalists um, and even fewer elite loyalists were ever tarred and feathered, but it only took a few examples to make the point. Instead, we see dishonor play out in many ways that might strike us today as bizarre or juvenile, um, but they had a prof they had profound implications within 18th century honor culture. And each insult was designed to transform the formerly honored gentleman into a dishonored Tory. So the press often worked in tandem with crowds, uh, and newspapers are filled with attacks of, against loyalists uh, during this period, uh, sometimes by name. And uh, the attacks tend to be quite gendered or draw on racial racialized tropes. Um, and I'll just use uh, Tom Paine here for a second, his common sense, uh, just as an example. So he writes, a Tory is an apostate from the order of manhood. And he goes on to write that if you can still shake hands with the murderers, that's the British, then are ye unworthy of the name of husband, father, friend, or lover, and whatever may be your rank in life, you have the heart of a coward. So patriot writers likened loyalists to snakes, to worms, spaniels, slaves, cuckolds, jacobites, and to Judas himself. Patriots could also be quite inventive uh, with their physical insults. Um, one Massachusetts loyalist uh, was paraded from village to village in Cape Cod, sealed inside uh, the, uh, an ox carcass that he had purchased from a hated counselor. So because white loyalists uh, fought alongside indigenous warriors on the frontier uh, and black loyalists who joined the royal standard, um, they, the loyalists were accused at times of a kind of racial degeneracy or betrayal. And uh, insults often drew heavily on racial tropes. Um, one of the most controversial insults um, that we see in the records is shackling loyalists and sometimes shackling them to enslaved men. So here is an example uh, from, or an excerpt from a revolutionary newspaper uh, 
uh, printing a letter from Colonel William Woodford, who was the victorious commander at the Battle of Great Bridge early in the war in December of 1775. And he's announcing that he has ordered a loyalist uh, whom he refers to as cattle to be shackled to one of his brother, quote, one of his brother black soldiers. And something similar happened to Cadwalder Colden Jr., who was the uh, wealthy New York loyalist and son of the former governor of New York. And he was publicly shackled kind of in a chain gang between an enslaved man and an indigenous prisoner. And similarly, when rebel frontiersmen uh, captured Colonel Henry Hamilton, uh, who was accused of directing indigenous raids uh, against settlers uh, from British-held Detroit, uh, he was paraded through the streets of Williamsburg, Virginia, uh, in chains. And his lieutenant, Jacob Schieflin, uh, recorded that he and his fellow loyalist officers, quote, shed tears of indignation that their worthy chief should be so treated uh, based on such uh, infamous falsehoods. So to place a gentleman in irons was considered deeply humiliating since it supposedly tainted a free white man with the dishonor of slavery and the enslaved. And this was considered such a deplorable thing uh, that the Virginia legislature eventually prohibited the practice as too humiliating even for loyalists. And one other uh, example that kind of highlights the racial overtones uh, of the insults and shaming uh, can be found in the loyalist claim of the widow of Peter Guire, who was a Connecticut loyalist, um, and uh, he and his family resettled in New Brunswick. According to a witness, uh, Guire was seized by a mob and branded with a hot iron on the forehead with the letters GR, so George, uh, George Rex. Um, so in other words, uh, the mob was uh, the mob marked Guire as the king's property, as the king's slave. So this was a transformative and a permanent insult. Guire could no longer claim the privileges of a white propertied man in Connecticut, and he died not long after in exile. And branding was considered uh, such a powerful punishment and uh, such powerful deterrent that an early 19th century American opponent of capital punishment uh, argued for branding criminals rather than hanging because it was a mark of, quote, complete political death. So perhaps more than attacks on the body, loyalists recorded their outrage at, uh, on attacks on their households. So the house was the most visible uh, emblem of a man's status, uh, and an ordered genteel home filled the obedient, uh, filled with obedient dependents, brought honor to a man and his family. So loyalist homes were therefore prime targets for revolutionaries, and incidents of vandalism, of harassment carried out by patriot mobs, uh, fill loyalist writings broken windows and fences, feces smeared on doors. Uh, this broadcast the loyalist dishonor and announced to their uh, to the community that their customary rights to privacy and, uh, uh, and privilege were no longer respected. So these uh, crowd actions bear a lot of similarities to folk practices uh, that we refer to as shrivery or skimmington or rough music, and they were common in both England and in the colonies. And they were normally intended to ostracize uh, community members for uh, adultery or spousal abuse or some other kind of transgression that was maybe not immediately punished by law. So when directed against loyalists, however, these rituals blended uh, social condemnation with uh, uh, action against a potential fifth column. Therefore, crowd actions against loyalists could take a decidedly violent turn, uh, exploding into direct attacks on the private space of the men and their families. And in the symbolic uh, theater of 18th century social relations, uh, the insults against the home were taken as serious assaults against the men's identity. So the ineffective response to uh, verbal or physical ins insults and the loyalist reliance on the British for protection and redress served to exacerbate pa patriot contempt for loyalists and their cause. And insults like these compelled loyalist gentlemen to either recant and apologize, which was always an option, uh, depending on what they had done, um, or flee and remove all doubt of their allegiance. So the political death of a householder could leave the former dependents at the mercy of their husbands or father's uh, enemies. And since the loyalist himself could not be taken, then the family and the household could serve as powerful substitutes. 
Uh, so Edward Brindley of Massachusetts told the claims commissioners after the war that a uh, the Patriots, uh, the revolutionaries left a troop of soldiers in his house, uh, even in his wife's dressing room. And to add to the misery, the rebels opened the loyalist home uh, as a kind of like a, a spectacle and uh, invited people in to have a look at to see a Tory woman. Um, likewise, the stately home of the wealthy New York loyalist Oliver Delancey uh, was attacked and burned to the ground, and his uh, wife and daughters uh, sort of uh, uh, forced to run into the woods in their in their uh, bedclothes. So. Um, the last one of these examples I'll give you is uh, the what happened at Johnson Hall here. You can see in the Mohawk Valley of New York, and in early 1776, the Baronet of the Mohawk, uh, the Baronet uh, Sir John Johnson, he broke his parole, and I have a whole chapter on parole breaking and why the loyalists thought they could do this. Um, and he fled his house, uh, fled his house arrest, and uh, 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 fled to uh, the British in Canada to join the army there. So in retaliation. Uh, Patriots ransacked Johnson Hall and arrested Johnson's wife, uh, Mary Watts Johnson, who was actually quite heavily pregnant at the time. And according to the loyalist Thomas Jones, uh, quote, to add insult to insult, a, quote, dirty rebel shoemaker turned lieutenant uh, climbed aboard Lady Johnson's carriage, sat beside her uh, in a suit of Sir John's clothes and a clean shirt and a pair of stockings stolen at the hall, he writes and sat with her on her whole journey to Albany. So this was not just a joke at Mary Johnson's expense. It was an attack on John Johnson's uh, role as a father, as a husband, as a householder. And there's also that implicit sort of sexual threat, I think, involved here as well. So in addition to uh, uh, such insults that, that I just described, revolutionary authorities broadcast political death through auctions of confiscated estates. And you can see here a couple advertisements, uh, one from Massachusetts and the other one from Pennsylvania for the sale of confiscated loyalist property. Uh, and you can see in the, uh, the Massachusetts one, they're described as absentees. So public auctions marked a man's political death just as a funeral might his natural death. Uh, members of the public could purchase and take over uh, the public and private spaces of these former gentlemen um, or just get some tools at a bargain uh, from their shed. The Massachusetts Committee advertised the sale of the former governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Thomas Oliver's, quote, very elegant and beautiful situated former home. Um, auctioneers in Pennsylvania sold uh, Jacob Duche's uh, uh, bedsteads, uh, tables, chairs, looking glasses, and so on. So the auctioneers are penetrating the Loyalists' former intimate spaces and dismembering their, the Loyalist lives piece by piece. And to Loyalists like Peter Van Schack, uh, Confiscation was an example of the Patriots, quote, vindictive justice. And he argued that revolutionaries sought to perpetuate the loyalist punishments down to innocent posterity so that the family may forever uh, be accompanied by the infamy of the father. And loyalists argued these final violations of the household as evidence of the revolutionaries' true power-hungry motives. Um, the, su the suspected loyalist uh, James Allen of Philadelphia recorded in his diary that, quote, the most, the most insignificant now lorded over with impunity and without discretion over the most respectable characters, men who could barely scare, men who could scarcely maintain their families now live in splendor. In short, this country is agitated to its foundations and will probably soon be overturned. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm working on uh, this biography of Joel Stone of Connecticut, and this is just one page uh, from his thoroughly documented uh, claim on the British crown for his losses, just to give you a sense of what these uh, documents look like. And uh, this is a copy of part of the ledger kept by the constable who was responsible for inventorying and selling all the items found inside Joel Stone's home and shop. So you can see kettles, uh, pots, buttons, shovels, everything, every small little thing. And when the war was over, Stone's family and friends encouraged him to return, and he probably could have without too much trouble, um, but he simply could not get past insults like this. Uh, he was never tarred and feathered, and he was even fairly well treated when he was captured at one point, um, but he could never let go of the sense of dishonor embedded in the act of confiscation and in the cancellation of the debts that were owed to him by his neighbors. <laughs> 
So how could loyalists respond, politically dead uh, loyalists respond to these insults and dishonors? Well, Anglican clergy in uh, New York and other places uh, um, were united in their advice to refugees. And that was to refrain from violence if they could and wait for legitimate government uh, to restore order. So in this sermon here, you can see called uh, A Discourse on Brotherly Love from 1777, the Loyalist chaplain Samuel Seabury condemns the idea of revenge, and he compares it to, quote, the impetuosity of mighty watch waters, which will drive us headlong down its furious current, bearing away all the little remains of principle, overwhelming the feeble restraints of reason. So though the Loyalists had been badly treated by their enemies, Pursuing revenge would leave the loyalists unsatisfied, he, he writes, unsatisfied with anything but the destruction of its object. So he advised his listeners and his readers to reject the, quote, lust, bitterness, and malice of revenge, and follow instead gentle, benign, humane propensities to promote peace, unity, and concord among the, among the brotherhood of men. And the Reverend Charles Inglis, uh, which was one of his colleagues, also warned that, quote, civil wars are more cruel and more barbarous than foreign wars and more destructive to morals. And so in a war between neighbors and kin, he warned, quote, personal revenge and animosity mingle and kindle up the soul to tenfold rage and must be avoided at all costs. So for these clergymen, true honor meant reason and stoic restraint and not giving in to the passions of violence. Now, in contrast, uh, Simeon Baxter, who was a loyalist preacher held prisoner in the notorious Simsbury Copper Mines in Connecticut, um, he argued that revenge in the loyalist case was not only fully justified, but had divine sanction as well. So he wrote, we have this, we have civil, we have the rights of civil uh, society to restore. We have honor, virtue, and religion to maintain. Let us therefore take the first prudent opportunity to revenge our wrongs he writes, the law of retaliation uh, was the law of nature. And he uh, sort of uh, uh, admonished loyalists who were, quote, unwilling to kill their oppressor with a dagger in the dark. So the cause of justice, he's arguing, supersedes all of the concerns and makes any action honorable that helps restore society and helps restore the loyalists to their place in that society. So British commanders obviously are going to uh, were were deeply distrustful of the intentions of these armed loyalists that were operating out of New York. Um, Andrew Elliott, who was also a loyalist, uh, shared these deep misgivings about the refugees, and he advised British commanders that it will be quote dangerous to use refugees, but as the commander in chief, that is the British commander in chief, uh, directs him to uh, direct, uh, directs and to him alone the loyalists should look up. So in other words, it was essential that the British always had control of the Loyalists, and if they were allowed to operate on their own, under their own Loyalist commanders, it will, quote, produce disagree disagreeable consequences in times when revenge and necessity go hand in hand, and England aims at conciliating more than conquering. So for their part, many rank and file loyalists bitterly resented both being underemployed by the British in the war and accusations of brutality when they finally did actually participate in the, in the fighting. Some outrages were really hard for the loyalists to justify, such as the Board of Associated Loyalists execution of their prisoner Joshua Huddy in 1782. And what was most infamous about this killing was that the group attached this uh, chilling note to the body, claiming responsibility and threatening more killings. And as you see, this note was printed throughout the colonies and it made its way to England. Uh, and the Board of Associated Loyalists, which was led by William Franklin, Ben Franklin's uh, son, uh, they defended their actions as just retaliation and self-defense uh, against patriot brutality. So the debate over honor and justice of this act of revenge caused an irreparable rift between the loyalists struggling to keep Britain in the fight and Sir Guy Carleton and other British commanders who really just wanted to defuse the situation and extricate Britain from her former colonies. And to end the cycle of revenge, Carleton refused to consent to any further raids uh, and uh, from occupied New York. And the loyalists disbanded their sort of privateering uh, group in disgust. <laughs> 
So I'm pretty much running out of time, but I just want to uh, make one last point about political death and, and, and dishonor. And it's that they were not permanent. So the Canadian provinces of Upper Canada, that's Ontario, uh, New Brunswick, um, uh, were both formed uh, to house loyalists as their refuge. Uh, and gentlemen exiles from the United States formed the new ruling elite of these new places. Common farmers and loyalist soldiers were also provided generous land grants as part of their loyalist pension or bounty from the British crown. And I mentioned earlier that about 60,000 people uh, give or take, uh, loyalists left uh, the United States. But this means that far more loyalists stayed in the United States uh, than left. And uh, most loyalists just quietly reintegrated into the new republic. So how did they do it? Um, well, some loyalists, first of all, uh, like those in the board of associated loyalists that uh, were responsible for killing Huddy, um, or groups like Butler's Rangers who fought alongside Indigenous warriors on the frontier, they could never return home, and they knew that. Other Loyalists waited until tempers and passions cooled, and they simply asked to be accepted back into their former homes. And this option was well known among the Loyalists in exile uh, in the Canadas and in New Brunswick, um, but readmission depended on apologizing and giving up their identity as loyalists. And this was just too much for some loyalists to accept, uh, like the Massachusetts loyalist, Ed, uh, Edward Winslow. And uh, he described uh, uh, former loyalist officers who accepted reintegration as, quote, giddy, eccentric, and discontented characters who made a voluntary sacrifice of their former honorable principles and meanly skunked, uh, skulked uh, back into the United States. So they abandoned their loyalist identity and transformed, he writes, the most meritorious actions of their lives into the most atrocious offenses which they ever committed. So whereas poor farmers could move to the frontier and put the war behind them and just sort of hope no one would find out, uh, a known gentleman really had to apologize, sometimes publicly, uh, and they relied on their families and former friends uh, to plead their case. So as Winslow fumed, though, they had to present themselves as deluded men, men who never bloodied their fingers, he writes, in petitions to these Republican tribunals. But he was sort of right. Genteel custom and discretion and the intercession of family allowed many former uh, loyalist gentlemen to be forgiven and to reintegrate eventually uh, as American citizens. So to hardline loyalists like, like Winslow, though, that kind of dishonorable political rebirth was worse than political death. And for, um, but for many loyalists uh, who were reuniting with their family and friends in the United States, uh, reconciling to the new political reality was the honorable path. So for men like Winslow or for William Jarvis that you see on your screen and his son, uh, both seen decked out in their Queen's Rangers uniform, uh, loyalism and honor became inseparable. So in Upper Canada and the Maritime Provinces, the Loyalist identity was taken on by the next generation, um, by what one Canadian historian referred to as Redeemer children, who embraced the idea that they had that distinct right to respect, to entitlement, to privilege over other Canadian settlers because of their sacrifices. And I conclude the book uh, with a discussion of the political violence uh, that broke out in Upper Canada in the 1820s and the 1830s between loyalists and reformers, tired of the loyalist domination of the colony. Violence that bore striking resemblance uh, and striking similarities to the political violence uh, that led to the loyalist expulsion in the American Revolution. And I'll just call back to those earlier portraits I looked, we looked at where the gentlemen look away. And in this one, Jarvis looks right at the viewer and his boy dressed in the loyalist uniform uh, holds the gun, uh, looks to his father and perhaps, you know, thinking that, uh, uh, thinking of the time when it will be his turn to carry on the fight between loyalists and rebels. So for all their political differences, uh, loyalists and patriots operated within the same cultural framework of symbols, of rituals and virtues that led them to justify and rationalize their allegiances. Patriots and loyalists defended their political choices and attacked their enemies in the language of honor and manhood. By definitively connecting the idea of loyalism with the idea of dishonor, of effeminacy, of racial gen uh, degeneration, betrayal, Patriots successfully neutralized the appeal of loyalism and the loyalist threat. 
the Loyalists were consistently humiliated and dishonored by their more numerous and better organized enemies and were transformed into politically dead Tories. So my book goes into far more detail about how these concepts and customs of dishonor directly influenced uh, the progress of the Revolutionary War and its aftermath, from clashes over parole and prisoner exchange, frontier violence, privateering, and the loyalist struggle for recognition from the British officers and crown. Yet even in political death, loyalists continue to cling to the same ideas of honor, transforming failure and indignity into sacrifice and martyrdom. Or they relied on the peacemaking nature of honor to bury the past and to become American citizens. And well into the 20th century, the loyalists endured this strange duality in North American memory, on the one hand commemorated as, uh, for their role in establishing English Canada, and on the other reviled as dishonored Americans. Thank you. I guess I have time for some questions. Yes, and we have uh, quite a few good ones. Oh. So um, <laughs> hopefully we can keep this uh, in a nice time frame. Um, I'm going to start you off with a uh, more broad question. And I think I alluded to this a little bit before, uh, before we started the Zoom meeting. At the beginning, you mentioned that we've had uh, quite a few speakers recently uh, discussing loyalists. And um, I mean, there's been a lot of focus. There have been a lot of books written recently about loyalism. Um, what do you think the the catalyst is for that? What's driving that? And why 2023, 2024 uh, to tell that story? Uh, yeah. Um, so if we think back to the historiography of loyalists in the United States, um, I think if the first histories are written in the 1840s uh, by Lorenzo Sabine, and he, um, I think he republishes that work in the 1860s. So these two moments, maybe around the Mexican-American War, Civil War, where there's deep polarization and deep uh, political animosity in, in the United States, perhaps. Um, there is sort of an uptick in the early 20th century, um, so the, the, the 19 aughts. Um, perhaps in the progressive era, that sort of that sort of uh, that sort of um, period of political sort of controversy, and then you really get a uh, quite an outpouring in the '60s and the '70s. Um, again, uh, a period of political upheaval, I think, in North America, and so I kind of wonder if uh, um, that's sort of perhaps why interest is being driven um so since since the um since the the uh, so the early teens late aughts of the of the 2000s um, um as a canadian right uh, loyalists are sort of and i grew up in a town settled by loyalists so they've always kind of been around me and they've always been sort of that uh, the oldest sort of thing that was that was sort of drawing my attention in 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 growing up um so that's why i'm interested in them, uh, sort of understanding the roots of, of, uh, of my own home in a way. Um, but yeah, that's my, that's sort of my guess of, of why the loyalists have this recurring appeal in, in the United States. Great. Thank you. Um, and you mentioned that you were sort of, you, you grew up in a, in a town, um, founded by loyalists. Uh, what, this is an interesting question. How is, uh, loyalist history taught in schools up there? Um, uh, well, it's interesting. Um, it's changed a lot. Um, I don't think the loyalists are there. There's a great deal taught about them anymore across. I think is there's there's a there's a part in like the grade seven curriculum and again in grade nine or something like that in high school. Um, but uh, you know, Canada. We used to have this idea that everyone said, "Well, Canada didn't have slavery and all this kind of stuff." Well, right that that myth has been burst, and that uh, part of that myth is that the loyalists um, brought enslaved people from the United States. So we used to like to celebrate the black loyalists, and, and that they were uh, part of that refugee movement. And so now it's sort of reckoning with the fact that a lot of these loyalist uh, leaders, I showed William Jarvis back there, there's Jarvis Street in Toronto, and there's uh, lots of these uh, street names in Toronto and big cities that are named after uh, people who enslaved other people, right? Um, and so that in our sort of discourse is sort of uh, what's going on, I think, a bit with the thinking with the loyalists. Um, one viewer would like to know, were there associated acts uh, conferring dishonor on patriots uh, in places and at times that, say, the British military had the upper hand, which was 
probably the majority of the war, you know, after a big say at the beginning of the war, when how after taking New York, um, for example, um, can you speak on that a little bit, please? Yeah, um, that sort of ritual, uh, ritualized kind of dishonor. I can't quite think of a specific example, um, but most notoriously, um, loyalists. There were quite a few loyalists that were employed in the uh, uh, prison hulks in uh, in New York, and uh, Ethan Allen uh, and Philip um, uh, Freneau write about uh, what it was like to be uh, in these prisons with the loyalists, with the Tories um, uh, as their guards, and it was pretty pretty brutal. Um, so when you know I talk about that sort of um, that uh, sort of dichotomy between reconciliation and revenge, well, uh, there were a lot of these instances where when loyalists did get the upper hand, uh, they took advantage of it. Right? It was a brutal civil war when it got going. Um, and uh, there were also a lot of incidents where um, when loyal, any act of armed loyalism essentially was characterized in the press and characterized by word of mouth as a dishonorable act of revenge, as piracy, as an atrocity. Um, so if you think of um, leaders like Bannister Tarleton uh, and, and your Bloody Band and, and Bannister's Quarter um, at uh, um, some of the, what is, was essentially a loyalist victory ends up being categorized as a loyalist massacre. Uh, and similar things happen on, on the frontier. But no, that's a good question. Um, and what, we, what I can say, though, is when the loyalists are in charge of Upper Canada, um, they tar and feather the reformers. They bust up the uh, the presses that are that are printing. When they have the numbers on their side, then it the the tide turns, and they use the exact same stuff that was used against them. And so um, that I find that really interesting. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that some Americans wrote while they were in the in the prison hulks uh, about loyalists. What what was what were the sentiments in the loyalist accounts toward the Amer? Is there much out there uh, written by loyalists? Oh yeah, William Franklin. Uh, he writes quite uh, lengthy about his uh, experience, and he he writes about um, and he gets quite uh, indignant that um, the um, about the the sort of the flurry of uh, patriot accounts that are that are being uh, uh, recorded of of uh, abuse of of American prisoners or uh, continental prisoners or. or uh, Patriot prisoners. Um, yeah, there was quite a bit. And uh, I showed you that little clip or that little picture of um, the Simsbury copper mines. And that was drawn by loyalists. Um, that was for Rivington's Gazette, I believe. Um, and that's, you can still go visit and go down and see uh, murals of the loyalists and, and being trapped down there. Um, and so they wrote quite a bit about what it was like to be captured by uh, by the, the the patriots, by the revolutionaries, by the rebels, and how you really wanted to avoid it and um even amongst gentlemen this could get really dicey and i mentioned cadwalder colden being chained up and all these different uh incidences of of uh, gentlemen loyalists being chained and that really got close it didn't quite do it but that really got close to breaking down the whole custom of prisoner exchange and parole where you know you would take a gentleman's word of honor that he wasn't going to run off on you and he could be granted certain privileges. And that all kind of started to fall apart with the loyalists because the loyalists were like, well, you've insulted me. So I'm going to say I, 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 you know, pledge my parole. Um, but because you've already shown yourself not to be trustworthy, I'm going to take my first opportunity to run off. Right. And so the whole system starts to come apart because of these insults and because of these, uh, uh sort of transgressions of custom. Thank you. Um, and speaking of William Franklin, uh, one viewer would like to know what happened to him after the war. I think he ended up in England. <laughs> that's one of those things where I'm like, oh, uh, no, I think I think that's where he he ended up. Now, he was ruined by the Huddy affair. Uh, he was never put on trial or anything like that. But his name kept coming up as the guy who really gave the nod to uh, to uh, kill that uh, kill their prisoner. Um but it was um, another guy, um, Lippincott, uh, who was put on, uh, who was put on, court, who was basically court-martialed by the British, um, and they acquitted him. And it's kind of a, a a tricky thing, a kind of a complicated thing of why they acquitted him. Um, but in the end, 
he ends up in Toronto and uh, he lives at his days there and uh, his ancestors or sorry, his descendants um, sort of record how old grandpa used to tell them about how he had this, this um, he had to do this because uh, Joshua Huddy had killed and dismembered his cousin and all this kind of stuff. Right. So very different, uh, very different uh, story that you get uh, in Canada from some of these guys. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, switching gears a little bit. Uh, there were some native American allies that that mm -hmm. fled to Canada afterwards. Uh, where did they fall on the on the social strata um, in Canada? And 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 uh, there's a part two. Of, was there like a general area where they settled, or were they kind of just all yeah. over the place? Yeah. So that would be the Six Nations um, of the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois. And they settled um, in, in a place uh, just near what's today Brantford, Ontario. Uh, and the reserve is called Ashwikan. And um, and the, the Six Nations essentially had, I guess, what you can think of as kind of a, a they, they broke apart in some ways over the, the question of, a lie, of allegiance, of which side they were going to, to go with. Um, so uh, Joseph Brandt, Tyndanega. He was the Mohawk leader, very, uh, very influential. And so uh, I can't remember the numbers we're talking here. A few thousand um, ended up there. So that's sort of um, south and west of Toronto. And then there's a few other um, settlements uh, near the Bay of Quinty, Tyndanega Reserve, um, where others, uh, others went. Um, and uh, yeah, and so... Um, that's that's sort of how how that story played out and um they still have you know relationships with the uh, groups that stayed in the united states stayed in stayed in new york um but that's largely that movement right largely a result of the sullivan campaign uh in northern new york great thank you and coming back to the the uh, 13 states america at that mm -hmm. time um what so you mentioned that some loyalists who eventually returned they waited and they played the waiting game uh mm -hmm. before doing so because it was a little too hot for them to come back for those that did stay were they doing the same thing you know apologizing ad ad admitting the wrongdoings if you want to call it that um it did were they welcomed back uh you know immediately after the war or did it did the sentiments vary state by state can can you give some insight on that it did vary quite a bit uh between the states and between communities uh so there were <clears throat> um uh, communities around new york city for example um where the majority population was loyalist and they didn't go anywhere and you know everything they stayed put the uh, the uh, the british leave and they stay and everyone kind of knows, oh, that's a Tory district or that's a street full of Tories. But that's sort of where it sort of ends, right? Um, there was there's one of the guys in the book, John Porteous. He's uh, he's a, a New York merchant who kind of was involved in the trade back and forth with Detroit. And uh, he um, fitted out loyalist privateers, one called the Vengeance, and was really active. And then uh, I'm not sure how he pulled it off, but he ends up in the Federalist Party and active in New York state politics. Um, and people called him, hey, he's a Tory, don't vote for him, right? But he's still stuck around. Um, in other places, uh, Rebecca Brandon's book on South Carolina um, is really good at articulating what happened down there. And um, it, it that's a case where um, the planter elite are sort of in charge of the estates of the loyalist planter elite that have left but they never actually sell the estates. They just kind of sit there. And then when their friends come back from exile and apologize, they're like, well, we never sold your estate, so here it is, right? Um, that wasn't going to happen in New York State. That wasn't going to really happen in Massachusetts where things were more more uh, where things were more bitter. Um, but that being said, in Connecticut, I'm just thinking through the different examples in my mind. I mentioned Joel Stone. Um, he could have come back, but he just refused flat out. Um, but one of his one of his associates uh, who lived sort of, you know, uh, on the next hill over, uh, he came back and was able to scrounge together the money and purchased his his uh, his, his old house. Um, but I would say, though, that even the loyalists in exile, so even Edward Winslow, who I quoted there, who was this you know really hardcore Massachusetts uh, Tory and Joel Stone and and uh, all these different characters, they kept up relations with their friends and family back in the states. They returned and they visited their homes. Uh, they went back and forth 
quite a bit. They sent their kids to Yale and <laughs> and uh, and school in the states. Um, so yeah, the uh, they repaired a lot of their social relations, even at a distance through letter writing, and they're really quite affecting letters where they writing their sisters and brothers and um, creating just larger social networks um, that crossed the border. Thank you. And going back to Canada, um, did loyalists receive compensation for their losses from the crown after the war? Uh, were there land grants for the wartime mm -hmm. services? Yeah, uh, they did. Um, and there's, a, I think the percentage is that for your typical, so th there's a proper claims commission that happened uh, after the war. And this was really for, there were women and there were some black loyalists, but this was really set up for compensating the gentlemen that lost their stuff. And um, uh, on average, um, the they were getting about 37% of what they claimed um, that they had lost. And things like uh, if you were a landowner, and this is sort of the prejudices of the British government at the time, if you were a landowner and you could say, I own 5,000 acres in the Mohawk Valley, that would translate pretty much to equivalent land in Upper Canada, right? So, so John Johnson was a huge landowner in uh, in Upper Canada. Uh, if you were a merchant and a lot of your stuff was booked at, you're out of luck, right? Because they weren't going to compensate that. And uh, so you'd get your 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 37% of what you lost for your house and then uh, a land uh, some kind of land grant um, that could actually be quite substantial uh, into the hundreds of acres, uh, um, depending on how many kids you had, that kind of stuff. Um, but it was forced. <laughs> so it required a lot of work, uh, but they worked together. And um, especially along the St. Lawrence and the Niagara River, um, they settled as regiments. So you kind of had that group cohesion that worked together. And so settling uh, so if you go to Niagara Falls, uh, Ontario, for example, that was all settled by Butler's Rangers. And they wow. they had incentive not to, they, they weren't going home, right? Uh, and so they, they developed that land there. Interesting. Very fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, now here, this might be an easy question for you. Um, and I have to, uh, I'm perplexed on this myself. Why is Upper Canada south of Lower Canada? Mm. It's how the river flows. You go upriver to get to Toronto. <laughs> There you, you go. go. Yeah, that's Easy that's uh, yeah. Easy enough. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now I am, and I am personally, and I'm sure our audience is fascinated uh, about this loyalist migrations project mm -hmm. um, going on. Uh, can you 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 spoke about a little bit about it in your talk? Um, can you tell us the, the origins of this, the background and the research process behind this? Because that can't be an easy task. No, it's not. And it actually was a bit more than I intended to, to bite off, to be honest with you. Um, so I work quite a bit with the United Empire Loyalist Association of Canada. I'm on their scholarship committee. Um, when I was a grad student, they were with this wonderful group that that would you know allow me to come and, and try out my ideas and see what they thought of them and that kind of stuff. And uh, they had kind of like the DAR or or I, I, I don't know how how, uh, how it works with your organization, but you have to prove your ancestry that you were a loyalist and that you uh, there's all these requirements. And so they have the all of these wonderful genealogies that are completed and vetted and sort of peer reviewed amongst their group. And so the idea I, I took to, took to them was let's try and map these like we have all this stuff let's try and see where all these threads and, and see what pops out right just sort of like just research for its own sake let's see what happens um and so i think they have something like nine thousand genealogies um and uh not all of them are publicly available so we're just using the ones that are made publicly available and then um there is the roles of the black loyalists that came up uh, to Nova Scotia as well. So those are our primary sources. So we started to use those as well. And I think we have about 2,500 or so families or individuals that we've plotted. And so if you go to the website right now, it's really raw. And we're we're just sitting there adding things. My my undergrads are working on it in the summertime. And so the hope is. Uh, we're coming up with the 250 to have it ready and to have uh, and to be able to sort of uh, uh, curate and to articulate what we're finding in 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 this data that we're plotting uh, and see if any see if there's any surprises, any things that pop out. Uh, 
But the one thing is that there was some, there's been some disagreement over numbers of how many loyalists came up. But when you start seeing just how many people are 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 coming uh, in the seventeen in the the, the seventeen eighty three eighty four period, there it's like, well, yeah, this is if this is how many are going uh, to Canada, it's certainly going to be around sixty thousand, I think. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how it started. It's definitely a work in progress. Uh, and if you're, if, if people here are, are visiting the website and you see bugs and things that aren't working, please let me know. It's very much in that sort of beta stage. Right, beta testing. There you go. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. I mean, well done. That's, that's, that's a huge undertaking. And I can imagine you felt like you bit off more than you could chew. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I didn't get it. I, I, you saw, you showed the, the map basically focusing around New York and, and the upper, uh, mm -hmm. states, um, for loyalists living, say, in the South, like Georgia, South Carolina, yeah. they generally go to Canada, too, or do they branch off and to the Caribbean or straight back to England? Yeah, there are a lot of them are heading south. There are a lot of them okay. are going to the, the Caribbean. Or like um, Florida. Florida. And, and Florida, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then they lose Florida. And that's a whole, sure, right. whole, whole issue. Um, south Carolina, we don't get a lot in Canada. Um, there's a few Virginia loyalists, um, but Virginia doesn't really have that many loyalists anyway. So there's a few Virginia loyalists that end up in Nova Scotia. Um, and, but yeah, that's a, that's a, it's a good question. We are, uh, seeing mostly sort of lots of Pennsylvania loyalists, lots of, uh, uh, New York loyalists, and that seems to be the bulk. Um, and then your Connecticut loyalists and your Massachusetts loyalists, those tend to be, uh, in Upper Canada, anyway, those tend to be the ones that are uh, the town founders. <laughs> you know, they're, the, they're the ones with the merchants um, who are sort of organizing uh, groups. Um, so that, yeah, that um, uh, we don't really see a lot of Southern loyalists make it to Canada. Great. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a great spot to wrap up. Tim, I want to thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Uh, the chat is commending you, so thank you uh, very much. I hope you all uh, go out and look at not only Loyalist Migrations, but look up Tim's book. I hope you have a spike in both book sales and on the uh, on the website. Um, thank you all again for joining us. Tim, again, thank you very much for a fascinating talk um, and our audience for here continued support of our mission. So everybody have a great night. I would say get home safe, but you're already home. Uh, we'll, we will see you next time and stay warm if uh, you're anywhere near DC. So uh, take care. Thanks, Tim. Good night, Thank everybody. Thank you very much. Yep. Bye.